Welcome back to the Trade Hacker Mindset. In this episode, we are going to be continuing with our series of topics from the book by Mark Douglas called Trading in the Zone. In this episode, we're going to be talking about the lure and dangers of trading. Trading the markets can be difficult to master and seemingly just out of reach. Professional traders have a secret. Trading requires total mental and emotional control. It requires the trade hacker mindset. All right, so let's jump into our discussion of the lure and dangers of trading and talk about why so few people become successful at trading even if they've been accomplished or successful in other careers or other areas of their lives. So to start with, what is the attraction of trading? You know, what what drew you into trading to begin with? Was it the was it the action of the market? Was was it your desire to be a hero? You know, I th- I think back to when I first started trading and I think that kind of desire to be a hero if you want to put it that way is interesting. Uh, it wasn't like I was I was trying to necessarily be a hero in the sense that that most people think about it, but I certainly thought that it was really cool that somebody could sit in front of their computer and analyze the market moving and profit from that in a way that other people couldn't. So from that perspective, I just was fascinated by the fact that people could do that, that some people could and some people couldn't. So I guess that would classify as desire to be a hero. Also euphoria. When you make a winning trade, when you make money from simply clicking a mouse, it can create a real sense of euphoria. But I think the absolute ultimate reason that the majority of people get into trading is for the aspect of freedom, right? It's the financial freedom. So you don't have to worry about paying your bills. It's the location freedom. You can work, you know, as long as you have an internet connection and a laptop, you can literally trade from anywhere in the world. And for those of you who work for somebody else and maybe you hate your boss or you hate the people you work with, it creates that freedom of working for yourself by yourself, not having to deal with working for somebody else. And it gives us the freedom to express ourselves in a way that we might not be able to in other professions or other areas of our life. You know, if, if you're like me, you know, I've been, I've been self-employed. I've been an entrepreneur. My, I've been a trader my entire life. And so part of the attraction for me is that I don't, I don't like to play by other people's rules. I like to make my own rules. And when it comes to trading the markets, we literally make all of the rules for ourselves. Now, of course, you know, you've got to meet financial minimum requirements to open a brokerage account. But otherwise, once you're ready to start trading, the, the possibilities that exist for how you go about doing it are, are really limitless. You know, you can trade bonds, you can trade stocks, you can trade options, you can trade futures. You know, there, there are so many different possibilities. You can do spreads, you can sell premium, you can buy options. You know, there's, there are limitless ways that you can trade. So if the trading environment is so unrestricted, then why is the failure rate so high? You've probably heard statistics like 90% of traders fail within the first 12 months. And the reason is, is because if you have unlimited possibilities and you have unlimited freedom to take advantage of those possibilities, that's like no other environment that we're used to as human beings. So this is going to create psychological challenges that that very few people are actually properly equipped to deal with. Or frankly, they don't really have even the awareness that it exists. And how are you supposed to overcome a problem if you don't even know that that problem exists? So this freedom, this concept of freedom, that's fantastic. Freedom is great. But most people just don't have the mental framework to operate in an environment with so few boundaries. So let, let's take a step back. Let's go back, you know, deep into your childhood and kind of figure out, okay, why are we the way that we are? Everyone is born into some sort of social environment, right? And when I say social environment, that could be a specific family, a city, a state, a country, a culture, a structure. And every environment has some type of restrictions and boundaries or sets of beliefs that create this behavior that we live in. And this structure, this code of behavior, it, it limits individuals and how they can express themselves. And these structures were, were established before we were even born. 
And so when we show up in this world, all of these things are already in place. And so it's, it's pretty easy to see why a, a certain individual's need to express themselves can conflict with what's already in place with the culture that we're born into. And as a trader, we, we face this, this kind of fundamental conflict as well. So think about this, ask, ask yourself this question. What's one characteristic? What's one form of personal expression that every child born on this planet, regardless of their culture or race or color or location, what is one characteristic that every child has? The answer is curiosity, right? Every child is curious. Every child is eager to learn. They're like little sponges that just soak in everything. They're like little learning machines. If, if you have kids, you'll understand what I'm saying. But even as infants, kids seem to kind of know what they want and what they don't want. You know, if you have kids, I'm sure you've, you've had an experience where, you know, your, your child who's just an infant, they do something or they express themselves in something that they want or don't want. And you kind of look at your spouse like, how do they know that they want that? And that's just the, the natural inner force that they have that every child has when they're born. So we all have these natural attractions to certain things and there's certain things we, we love or attracted to and there's certain things that we, that we are not attracted to. And sometimes that comes as an innate kind of we're, we're born with that type of force within us. You know, if you think about it, I'm sure you could list out a lot of things that you have absolutely no interest in. You could probably make another list of things that you're sort of interested in. And then lastly, you could make a list of everything that you're just absolutely super passionate about. And usually on that first list, the, the, the list of things that you're not interested, that's probably a pretty long list, right? And then the things that you're, that you're somewhat interested in, that list gets a little bit smaller. And then the things that you're absolutely just extraordinarily passionate about, that list gets even more narrow, more small. And, and some of those things that we get from our environment, but a lot of those true passions are really just part of our DNA. They are, they're part of our true identity. They're part of who we are. Okay, so we talked about the lure. We talked about the attraction of trading. What about the dangers of trading? How about social conflicts? You know, the social culture, the social structure that we're born into, it, it might contradict that our, need, our actual internal needs are in our internal interests. So, for example, I, I grew up as an athlete. I, I played sports. I played primarily football and baseball. And so it was, it was pretty natural that when I became a dad and I had kids, you know, I had an interest in, in hoping that they would become athletes as well. And so as my kids were born and started to grow up and they saw me continuing to play sports and have an interest in watching sports and, and, and doing athletic activities, it was somewhat natural to think that they would probably want to do the same. And so I've got my oldest son who is, is that way. He's, he's diehard sports, wants to watch football all the time, wants to play football, wants to play baseball nonstop, 24-7. That's all he wants to do. And then I've got my youngest son who actually at a, a very young age, he, was, he did seem really passionate about basketball. Literally every time we would pass, uh, you know, drive by and there was somebody with a, a basketball hoop in their driveway, he would freak out because all he wanted to do was shoot baskets. And we th so we kind of thought, okay, you know, he's, he's going to have an interest in athletics as well. And then once he got to the age of starting to play organized sports, started to put him in basketball and, and he just kind of felt acted disinterested. Uh, we tried soccer. He played that a little bit, but didn't show much interest. Started playing baseball. I was coaching his baseball team. And one day, and this is after just a couple years of playing baseball, really young, still t-ball, you know, he comes up to me in the dugout in the middle of a game, looks me dead in the eye and says, Dad, I don't like sports. Now, you know, for, for somebody who, who loves sports, you know, that could be a little bit painful as a parent. I mean, so after I, you know, pulled the dagger out of my back, you know, I thought, okay, okay. You know, I mean, that's, that's totally cool. You know, we, I think we all just want our kids to be happy. So we ended up finding, you know, he, he didn't really do anything for about six, nine, maybe 12 months. Uh, and then he finally you know, started showing interest in playing musical instruments. And now he goes to the School of Rock and plays keyboard. And he's great at it and he loves it. He, he's absolutely passionate about it. But I've, I've seen a lot of families or situations where there is a huge lack of support in that area. You know, so kids are sometimes denied their natural way of expressing themselves. 
You know, what if I would have told him, no, you are not playing music. You are going to get on that baseball field and you are going to learn to love it. Well, what happens is, is situations like that can create an imbalance. And an imbalance is when our inner needs or our inner interests conflict with our exterior environment and experiences. And this, thing, and this can range from really minor things or, or what you might perceive as minor with your children all the way up to major things. I mean, there are, there are professional athletes who hate playing the sport that they play. But sometimes the culture and the societal pressure for them to do and make their parents proud and, and continue to do what their, what their social environment kind of forced them into, it, it can really create mental and emotional pain and imbalance uh, between your inner interest and desires versus what's going on in your external environment. So I think sports and interests like that can be a, a pretty common example. Another very simple example could just be a simple situation where, you know, a child sees a hot stove light up and it's red and they want to touch it. And so they go to touch it. That's their, in a very minute way, that's their interest. That's their, that's their need. That's they, what they want to do. And they get a lack of support because their parent yells, no, no, don't touch that. Don't touch that. Right. And so, and so what do they do? They back off and they start crying and, and it creates this imbalance where their inner need or their inner want to touch that uh, is, is, is kind of pushed away from them from their external environment. And so sometimes it's a situation where uh, the external environment, our situation, our culture, our, us as parents, we're just trying to protect our kids because they don't know what they don't know. And so it's not always a situation of you're just, you're forcing your kids to do something they don't want. It's, it's all of these little things that we experience growing up that we want to do, but we're told, no, we can't do that. And then it goes the other way as well. When we do get something that we, we, that we want, when we do get to do something that we are curious about, something that we're interested in, that creates the, the opposite state, right? It, it's inner balance. We get a sense of satisfaction or happiness. But it's when these environments are not in sync, when they're not in correspondence, that's when we start to experience dissatisfaction or anger or frustration or emotional pain. So when we're denied freedom to express ourselves in some particular way, why does this cause us this emotional pain? Mark Douglas in his book says that, you know, kind of his theory on this is that needs and desires create mental vacuums. And in, in the world we live, we have a natural tendency to not tolerate a vacuum and it moves to fill it whenever one exists. So if a need creates a mental vacuum, the universe is going to fill it with inspiring thoughts, the thoughts that in turn can inspire movement and expression that result in the fulfillment of that need. So if you think of your overall mental environment, kind of just like the, the, the universe at large, and once we recognize that need or desire, then we, then we move to fill that vacuum with an experience in the external environment that we live in. And if we're denied that opportunity, then, there, then it literally feels like something is missing. It feels like we're not whole. And it puts us into this state of imbalance or emotional pain. You know, if you take, your, uh, take a toy away from a child who's not finished playing with it, even if the reason you took it away may be a good reason to take it away, that child's going to experience emotional pain. And by the time we're adults, can you imagine counting how many times we've heard these things? No, no, you can't do that. You can't do it that way. You have to do it this way. No, not now. Let me think about it. No, I'll let you know. It can't be done. What makes you think you can do it? You have to do it. You have no choice. All of these things that we hear growing up from our parents, from our teachers, from our coaches, from you know, anybody in a position of authority. We literally hear thousands and thousands of denials by the time we become adults. You know, I, I call them denied experiences, and Mark, Mark Douglas in his book calls them denied impulses. So what happens to all these denied impulses that, that don't get fulfilled? Do they just go away? I mean, sometimes they can if, if they're reconciled in some way. You know, if we do something or if somebody else does something that kind of puts our, our mental state back, to bal back into a balance, you know, a simple thing that a child does is they just simply cry, right? That's, that's kind of their, their strategy for creating that, you know, getting back into balance. That's their, that's their mechanism that they use to get back into balance is simply just to cry. So even, even though this original impulse may never have been fulfilled, scientists have talked about how tears actually have negatively charged ions. And so when crying happens, it actually expels this negative, negatively charged energy. 
Now, just like there's no crying in baseball, there's no crying in trading either. Although, trust me, there's been plenty of times where I've found myself almost in tears over trading in the past. The problem is that most of the time, these denied experiences, they, they, they never get reconciled. You know, sometimes even as a, a young boy, you know, I mean, sometimes the reasons that your, your parents don't want you to cry, right? Especially boys, you know, don't cry, be a man. And so a lot of time this, this, this behavior is discouraged. And there's a lot of times where, you know, parents don't even bother to explain to their children why they're being forced to do something that they don't want to do. I mean, I'm guilty of this, just, just as everybody is. The reason you, you can't do this is because I said you can't do this, right? Even if you do try to explain it to a child, you know, there's no assurance that it's actually going to be effective enough to, to reconcile that imbalance that's going on in, inside that child. So if these impulses, if these desired impulses, if they're never reconciled, then they usually start kind of manifesting themselves inside of people. And sometimes it creates an addictive or a compulsive behavior pattern. You know, I'm sure you've seen many people who something that they were deprived of as a child later in life actually becomes an addiction of theirs. You know, we all know somebody who, who always has to be the center of attention. They always need to have everybody paying attention to them. And most likely it was probably because they were deprived or they didn't feel like they got enough attention when they were kids. And so this deprivation becomes unresolved, kind of emotional energy within them that, that makes them behave in ways that they're going to try to satisfy this addiction. And maybe that doesn't apply to you, or maybe it does, but, but regardless, what's important is that we understand that, that we all have these unreconciled, denied impulses. All of us have them inside of us. And all of these things affect our ability to stay focused, stay disciplined, and relating it back to trading, I know I kind of went off on a tangent, but this all relates back to how we make decisions and how we control our discipline when it comes to trading. It goes that deep. It goes that deep into our childhood uh, and all the experiences that we've had and our denial of these impulses that can have a major, major effect on our trading. All right, so enough about your childhood. Let's, let's jump more back into trading. So to, to operate effectively in this trading environment, we have to set rules. We have to have safeguards. And we have to set rules that we're actually going to follow. Because if we don't set these rules, if we don't follow these rules, you can really create enormous damage that we can do to ourselves, both mentally and financially. So to prevent this possibility of, our, of exposing ourselves to damage, we have to create an internal structure. We have to create a, a special mental discipline. We have to create a, a perspective about the markets that guide our behavior. And we have to set these up so they guide our behavior in a way that creates value in our own interest, for our best interest. Because think about this. this, this structure that we create, it has to exist inside of us. We have to create it in our mental environment because the market does not provide structure for us. Remember like what I said in the beginning, the market has limitless opportunities. There's limitless ways to trade. So it does not provide any structure. We have to create that structure for ourselves. Think about it. The market's like a stream. It's constantly in motion. Even, even if they're closed, even when the market's closed, prices are still in motion. And the reason people can come from other professions that they've been super successful in, you know, super successful doctors or entrepreneurs or lawyers or whatever it might be, and they come to trading and they get their asses handed to them. And the reason is, is because in the, in the markets, it's a boundaryless environment. There's nothing else that we do in our society that, that prepares us for this boundaryless environment. When you're a trader, there's, there's no one except yourself that's going to force you to decide in advance what your risk is. Remember, every trade has a probable outcome. Therefore, there, you know, it could be a loser. There is no trade that's a guaranteed winner. And what separates winning traders from losing tra traders is that the consistent losers do almost anything to accept the reality that no matter how good a trade looks, no matter how good the setup is, there's still a possibility that that trade could lose. And so without this structure in place, you know, a losing trader is going to be susceptible to a lot of justification, rationalization, 
Because if he's thinking that he can't lose, then there's no reason to define in advance what his risk will be. And if you're not defining what your risk in advance will be, then there's going to be problems for you as a trader. So some of you might be thinking, yeah, but what about gambling? What about, you know, what about going to a casino? And you'll hear people say who don't understand trading, who are not real traders, they will say, you know, gambling and trading are pretty close to each other. You know, you know, one's just a little bit more accepted than the other. And that couldn't be further from the truth. The reality is that trading is not gambling, but there are a lot of traders who gamble. Let me say that again. Trading is not gambling, but there are a lot of gamblers who trade. And, and sticking to our point about the, you know, the limitless opportunities and the, the ability that you've got to create those, those defined rules, you know, even in a, in a casino or some type of gambling arrangement, that's, that structure is already in place. Think about this. All gambling games have kind of a specified beginning, middle, and end. Once you decide you're going to play, you can't change your mind. You're, you're in it for the duration of that game. You know, think about if you sit down at a blackjack table at a casino, you, know, you put your money in. Well, after the dealer flips the first card over, you can't just take your money out. You're in that for the duration of that hand. You're in it from the beginning to the end of that hand. But that's not true about trading. Trading, the prices are constantly in motion. And nothing begins until you decide it should begin. And it lasts as long as you want it to last. And it doesn't end until you want it to be over. And so regardless of what you may have planned going in, there, there are so many different mental and psychological factors that can come into play that might cause you to change your mind, become fearful, become overconfident, become distracted, change your mind. You know what? There's a, there's an unlimited number of things that can happen that can cause you to, to, to change and get in or out or stay that you didn't plan to happen when you first started. So because, you know, gambling games like blackjack or, or anything else in a casino, because they have a formal ending, they force you as a participant to be an active loser. If you're on a losing streak, you can't keep on losing without making a conscious decision to do so. And at the end of each game, it causes the beginning of a new game. But trading has no formal ending. The market's not going to take you out of a trade. So unless you have the appropriate mental structure to end a trade in a way that's in your best interest, you can actually become a passive loser in the market. Meaning once you're in a losing trade, you don't necessarily have to do anything. You can keep on losing. You don't even have to watch. You can just ignore the situation. You can walk away. So the fact that trading never ends, this can be a curse or it can be a gift depending on how you use it in your, in your own mental environment. You know, the gift is that, you know, it might be for the first time in your life, you're in complete and total control of everything you do. The curse is that there are no external rules or boundaries to guide or structure our behavior when we're trading. So these limitless characteristics of the trading environment, you know, it, it requires that you act with some degree of restraint and self-control. And this structure that we create this, to, to guide ourselves through trading, this has to originate in your mind. And this is where we start getting into the problems that come along with, with trading and the mental environment. So one of the first problems that we run into with trading is, is just our willingness to create rules. Remember, we got into this, we got into trading for the freedom. And now you're telling me that I have to create rules? So sometimes it's, it's very black and white like that. But on the other hand, sometimes uh, it's, it's very subtle. You know, on one hand, we agree that rules make sense, that we got to have some rule, that, that we got to have some rules, that we have to have some structure. But in the back of our mind, we're kind of thinking, yeah, I'm, I'm really not going to follow these rules. I mean, I, I see it all the time in our community. We stream live and I, I trade in front of our community every morning. And, you know, our members are posting trades that they made. And, you know, some sometimes people will say, hey, I, you know, I took this trade in Microsoft and, and I'll look at the chart of Microsoft and, and you know, there'll be nothing there that would have created a situation in my mind to take a trade. And when they, when I ask them, you know, it, it usually comes down to, it was a hunch. You know, they took the trade on a hunch because they felt like they knew what it was going to do, but that didn't follow the rules. We have very strict criteria that we lay out step-by-step step for, for how and why we take trades. And so sometimes even, even, you know, consciously we, we understand the rules, we see the rules, we see the performance of that trading strategy based on the rules. 
in the back of our mind, you kind of think, yeah, but, and it's kind of your ego talking, right? You, you, you think you can do better. And so you see why we were talking about these denied experiences, these denied impulses, because, you know, you've had all these denials all, all your life. Now you have this freedom. And now I'm telling you, now I'm kind of taking that toy away from you again. So whether you're aware of it or not, this, this conflict starts happening in your mind while you're trading. In other words, the very reason we are attracted to trading in the first place, which is the unlimited freedom of expression, the unlimited freedom of potential financial gain, the, the location independence, the freedom of being able to trade from any, anywhere in the world. This is the same reason that we have this natural resistance to creating the rules and boundaries to, to really guide our trading behavior. It's like when we first start trading, we found this utopia of freedom. And then you have someone saying, uh, actually, you've got to follow these rules. It's not as free as you think. And most traders understand that the need for rules makes sense, but it's, it's difficult to create that motivation. It's, it's difficult to create that structure in our own mind when we know that nobody else is making the rules for us. One of the other major problems that we face as traders is the failure to take responsibility. Because remember, trading is a, it's a pure, unencumbered, personal choice, and it has an immediate outcome. Remember how we talked about the example with the stream that's never ending, the market's always flowing. Remember, nothing happens until we decide to start, and it lasts as long as we want. And it never ends until we decide to stop it. So while we may want this freedom, maybe we want this ability to make these choices, that doesn't mean that we're always ready and willing to accept the responsibility for the outcomes of trading. So if you're not ready to accept that responsibility, then you might find yourself in a little bit of a dilemma. And that dilemma is, how do you participate in an activity like trading that allows complete freedom of choice and at the same time avoid taking that responsibility? If the outcome of your choice is unexpected, is risky, or it's not to your liking. The reality of trading is, if you want to create that consistency, that consistent profit that every trader strives to get, you have to start with the premise that no matter what the outcome of trading, it is completely your responsibility. And one of the reasons that, that very few people uh, succeed in trading, even if they've been successful in another career or another endeavor, is because very few people wanna take on this level of responsibility. And so when you become a trader, it's a little bit of a foreign concept. And the way to avoid this responsibility is, is simply to adopt a trading style that is basically random. And when I say random, I'm not talking about the potential randomness of the market. I'm talking about random trading styles like poorly planned trades or trades that are not even planned at all, or really just an unorganized approach that doesn't take any, any structure into consideration. Mark Douglas says, randomness is unstructured freedom without responsibility. I think that's a perfect way to put it. Randomness is unstructured, unstructured freedom without responsibility. Because think about this, when we trade with a, a well-defined trading plan, but we have unlimited sets of variables in the market, it can be very easy to take credit for the trades that turn out to our liking, the trades that turn out well, but it's easy at the same time to avoid taking responsibility for the losing trades. So remember, the market, the market creates these patterns that repeat themselves over and over again. So even though the outcome of a pattern can be random, the outcome of a series of patterns over many, many occurrences can be statistically reliable. So as an example, think about just flipping a coin, right? Theoretically, flipping a coin is a 50-50 probability. 50% 50 of the time it's going to land on heads, 50% of the time it's going to land on tails. But if you flip a coin 10 times, you know, there's, there's a decent chance, not a decent chance, but there's a, a significant chance that you could get eight heads and two tails, right? But does that, does that have anything to do with over the long run? Because if you flip a coin a thousand times, there's a much higher probability chance that you're going to end up getting close to 50% heads, 50% tails. 
So when it comes to trading, you have this randomness on individual patterns, but you have this statistically significant uh, structure of patterns over a long time. So this kind of creates a little bit of a paradox in our mind, but it's something that can be resolved very easily if you have the discipline, if you have the organization, if you have a very consistent approach to your trading. So tell me if this fits you. I've, I've worked with a lot of traders in our community, interacting with traders, and I've, I've seen you know all kinds of market analysis and extensive planning for trades that, they're, that they plan on taking. Maybe it's the next day, but then instead of putting on the trades that they actually planned, they did something completely different. You know, maybe you were watching CNBC that morning and you got this tip that you thought was great or you jumped on Reddit and Wall Street Bets and you found the next big, big YOLO stock. And then think about what happens. You jump into this new idea that you just came up with at the spur of the moment and had you stuck to your plan and had you actually made the trades that you're going to make, they would have turned out much, much better. You know, this, this is a classic example of how we become susceptible to unstructured random trading. And what's even worse is if that random idea that you just picked up that wasn't part of your plan strategy, if that trade actually works out, that just fuels your mind thinking that it's okay to trade that way. And then going back to our point about responsibility, if we trade our own ideas, if we trade our own planned market analysis and strategies, then our personal reputation is on the line in our minds, in our ego. We are now responsible for those. But if we take the idea of somebody else, we can always blame them because, oh, I shouldn't have taken that trade. It was their fault and not mine. However, that's why it's, it's difficult for some people to take their own trade ideas. They want to they take the trade ideas of somebody else. And that's because they don't want to take personal responsibility. I see this all the time in the community where I talk to people about, we're teaching you how to trade. We're not trying to build you up as a copycat trader where you're just copying the exact trades we take. We're trying to teach you how to trade so you can take ownership of your trading. And it all comes back to this concept of taking responsibility. Another problem that we face as traders is what Mark Douglas describes as an addiction to random rewards. He talks about some of the studies that have been done on giving random rewards to monkeys. For example, if, if you teach a monkey to do a task and consistently reward that monkey every time the task is done, that monkey quickly learns to associate a specific random outcome with doing that task. And to take it a step further, if you stop rewarding that monkey for doing the task, then it doesn't take very long for that monkey to simply stop doing the task. The monkey doesn't want to waste energy doing something that it's now learned it won't be rewarded for. However, it's, it's completely different if you start out the monkey with a purely random schedule for re rewards. So instead of consistently feeding the monkey every time it does the same thing, so in other words, if you, if you just give random rewards to the monkey for, for doing different things, then that monkey really doesn't understand if the reward is going to go away or not. Because now when that monkey gets this random reward, it, it's kind of a surprise. And so as a result, from the monkey's perspective, there's no reason to quit doing the task. So sometimes the monkey will keep on doing the task even without being rewarded. And, and sometimes they'll continue to do it indefinitely. So it's actually just a natural human behavior that we get addicted to random rewards. And probably part of it is just the kind of the uh, serotonin, I think is the right word, that, that, that's released in our brain when we get this kind of euphoria type situation that comes from when we get kind of a surprise or an unexpected treat. So if a reward is random, we never really know for sure when we might receive it. So many times we'll, we'll continue to expend energy and resources in the hope of experiencing that feeling again. And think about it. This is, this is why a massive amount of people play the lottery. You know, they may have got one of those scratch and win tickets and they, they won something. They've, they, got that, they got that dopamine, that, that serotonin. I, I'm not sure if I'm using the right word there, but one of those two. And, you know, they get that euphoric state in their mind from winning and they didn't really have to do much to, to get that. And so they continue to do the same thing. They continue to buy lottery tickets, hoping that, you know, they might hit the big one or they might get that an, another, uh, another win to keep that euphoric state of mind going problem is if we expect a particular outcome 
and it doesn't come, then we get disappointed. We start to feel bad. We start to feel disappointed. And if it keeps happening, then a lot of times this is when we just completely stop. So think about it from a trader's perspective. If you're randomly unorganized, you know, putting on trades and sometimes you get a hit, sometimes you get a win, uh, but then you hit a string of losers, you are more likely to quit because you you don't really know if that pain is going to continue or if you're getting to get back on the right track because what you're doing is completely random. And if you as a trader have this addiction to random rewards, then it's, it's going to be another wall. It's going to be another resistance to creating that consistency that we want as a trader. All right, so the last problem I'm going to talk about in this episode is the external versus internal control. Remember, our upbringing, the way we were raised, the environment in which we are raised in is this social environment, which means we have specific things that we want to that fulfill our needs, that fulfill our wants and desires geared towards that social interaction. So not only have we learned to depend on each other to fulfill these needs and wants and desires, but in the process, we've actually acquired many socially based controlling and manipulating techniques for assuring that other people behave in a, in a way that's consistent with what we want. Now, you might be saying, well, no, I don't do that. I don't manipulate people. I don't do any specific techniques or strategies to get people to, to behave like I want. But I assure you, you do. It could be very subtle. It could be up, uh, subconscious. But we all have these innate behaviors that have been created through this social environment that we've grown up in. So part of the confusion comes in where you look at the market and it seems kind of like a social uh, environment, right? A social endeavor because there's so many people involved, but the participants within a market or just call it the market itself is not something that you're ever going to be able to depend on. You can't depend on the market to do anything for you. You can't depend on the market to give you anything. In his book, Mark Douglas calls the market a psychological wilderness, where it's basically truly every man and woman for himself or herself. And in the market, there's no way to manipulate or control anything that the market does. So if you are one of those people who have either subconsciously or consciously learned to kind of manipulate and control people to get what you want, you're going to be very dissatisfied as a trader because there's no way to do that. And that's really one of the main reasons that you, you find these really uber successful people in other professions. But when they come to trading, they fail miserably. And that's because they, you know, in, in certain situations, they have the control. They have the ability to manipulate situations or people to gain what they're desiring, to gain what they want. And when they come to the market, they don't have that ability. That same trait that made them successful in something else is no longer something that benefits them when they're trading the markets. So that's why we've got to rewire our brains so that we can learn to control only what we can control, which is our perception and the interpretation of the information that the market is giving us. And we can learn to control our own behavior instead of controlling our surroundings. And when we can learn to control our mind, when we can learn to have that self-awareness and, and control ourselves, that's when trading becomes ultra easy and ultra successful and, and we create that consistency that we're always looking for. I hope this episode was helpful. If you'd like to be a part of our Trade Hacker community, just go to community.navigationtrading.com. It's free to join. We have hundreds of traders in there interacting daily, not only about mindset things like we're talking about today, but also sharing trade ideas and just interacting uh, on, a, on a daily basis about trading in general. So just go to community.navigationtrading.com and we look forward to seeing you on the inside. Take care.